The excitement had begun on June 28, 1956, when workers in Poznan, Poland, revolted against the communist rulers. The uprising was crushed, with 44 officially listed as killed, hundreds more wounded, and a thousand people arrested. The importance of this event was in the fact that it belied one of the basic tenets of communist theory. If workers were the rulers in a socialist society, against whom could they revolt? Escape from Red China, page 228. Just when speculation about the Polish situation was at its height, we received the electrifying news of the Hungarian revolt. The Hungarians had been chafing under oppressive communist rule, and security police opened fire on, fire on a Budapest crowd. A wave of violent riots began. Russian troops were called in to suppress them. Escape from Red China, page 229. In Shanghai, at least a few small-scale strikes took place. University students held demonstrations to protest communist oppression. Anti-communist slogans and posters began to appear on public walls. In the villages near Hangchow, hungry peasants suddenly attacked and killed the local cadres and then broke open the granaries. These examples of unrest, however, do not amply indicate the spirit which suddenly animated the whole nation. One could feel new life flowing back into the beaten-down people, and it was indescribably exhilarating. Escape from Red China, page 231. Bob Lowe helped to put an end to all the fun, and for his reward was chosen as one of the twelve delegates to go to Russia, where he would drink vodka and suffer embarrassment. Most of what little luxury food and what few consumer goods were available to the Russians came from China. The source of these gratifying luxuries was apparent, but the Russians paid for them with steel, precision, precision instruments, and heavy industrial equipment which went unnoticed by the average Chinese. The Chinese masses were aware only that everything was produced which might help everything that was produ everything they produced which might help alleviate the drabness of their existence was taken away by the Russians. Also, the fact that the trucks produced in both countries were identical proved that the Russian and Chinese industrial systems were being tied irrevocably together. Politics aside, therefore, the Chinese were becoming increasingly dependent upon the Russians and could not pursue an independent course even if they wanted to. Escape from Red China, page 250 and 52. If the masses received even a taste of civilized comforts, however, they would begin to expect and demand more with increasing impatience. But comforts cannot be enjoyed without some leisure, and leisure is meaningless without the liberty to use it as one chooses. In short, any real rise in the living standard for the masses would be impossible without political freedom and thus would threaten communist power. We Chinese businessmen, businessmen were familiar with the low living standard of the masses in our country, but what we saw in Russia shocked us. Escape from Red China, page 253. The truth was we saw examples of drunkenness constantly wherever we went. We'd always been told that under imperialism, capitalists drank too much because they were degenerate and that the workers sometimes drank excessively as a temporary escape from misery. In China, known alcoholics and drug addicts had been ruthlessly disposed of in the early days of the communist regime, and now anyone who appeared intoxicated in public would be quickly in serious trouble. Escape from Red China, page 259. On October 29, 1956, Israel had invaded Egypt. France and Britain bombed Egypt two days later and landed troops on November 5. In our discussion groups, the subject of Hungary was dropped, dropped completely, and we found ourselves beating on the tables in fury over the imperialist aggression. What we were really saying with genuine emotion was, why don't the French and British and Americans go to the aid of the Hungarians? Escape from Red China, page 232. 
Bob Lowe was privileged to hear a preview tape recording of Chairman Mao's secret speech in 1957, where Mao denied the capitalist lies that millions of Chinese had been murdered for being counter-revolutionaries, and Mao said it was not more than 700,000. And Bob Lowe thought that the time had come to finally try to escape from Red China. By far the largest percentage of escapees were simple, uneducated people. The truth is that the communists looked upon the pro proletariat with contempt. The truth is that the communists looked on the proletariat with contempt and could not believe that people outside that people outside would take seriously anything said by a mere worker or peasant. Escape from Red China, page three forty. Go on, one of them said. Our group now contained about 100 people. We began to move slowly, even reluctantly, along the road. It seemed almost too good to be true that we had only to walk a 100 yards to freedom. Gradually, however, our pace quickened, and suddenly a kind of panic gripped us. We broke into a run which became a wild, sobbing, clawing scramble. Some were weeping, others screaming, and others shouting, singing, laughing, or trying to do all three at the same time. Escape from Red China, page 344 and 5. Without exception, the refugees regarded Hong Kong as a paradise. The vast majority of the two million escapees lived on steep mountainsides in shacks made of flattened-out tins and used burlap bags that often were washed away by heavy rains. They walked miles for water, which they had to carry in a jar. They had no jobs, no change of clothing, and so little food that they were never without hunger. And yet they used the word paradise to describe Hong Kong. Escape from Red China, page 358. Bob Lowe got out just before the backlash from the Hundred Flowers campaign following the recorded speech of 1957, and Mao called the Hundred Flowers campaign the Great Leap Forward, but it couldn't even clear the ditch, and the Great Leap Forward would kill over 30 million Chinese. By this time, of course, the rhythm of the regime's suppression tactics was clear to everyone who had lived under communist rule. One segment of the population at a time endured the authorities' malevolence. When these people had been reduced through terror to complete subservience, the attention was turned to another segment, and then to another and another, until everyone had felt the awful weight of the regime's power. The whole process, then, was repeated. Everyone knew that the workers and peasants would now have their turn for further suppression. In Hong Kong, the prices of eggs, chickens, and vegetables suddenly began to soar. These commodities were imported from the mainland, and the peasants began desperately to consume their own produce, knowing that when the regime attacked them, they would lose everything. Escape from Red China, page 367. After the great plunge downward following the Night following 1957, China had, to, um, in, China had to import wheat from Australia and Canada in order to keep the army fed enough to stay in charge. And Bob Lowe said that China had become a huge concentration camp and that all the Chinese had become slaves, and his last words were, In short, the only advantage the communists have in the world, e ideological struggle, comes from weaknesses among the Westerners. If selfishness, disunity, blindness, ignorance, prejudice, and indifference are dominant factors in the democratic society, societies, then the communists will be strong indeed. Escape from Red China, page 377. The last sighting of a leopard in the Hong Kong area was in 1957, and the last tiger was seen in 1947, and the elephants and crocodiles and wild boars were gone a hundred years before that, along with the forest that had covered the island. The pangolin, the ferret badger, the striped and spotted civets, the eastern Chinese otter, the south China red fox, and the wild red dog disappeared, along with the barking deer and long-tailed macaques in 
Hong Kong, and nobody had seen any Chinese porcupines since 1966 and the largest gripe about lost property when Mao's communists took over had been from the American Boise Cascade Company, who had begun reforestation and watershed management in China. Unknown source. By the late summer of 1958, Mao decided that the Chinese could catch up with the Western world if they could smelt iron. And while the West had used huge factories making iron, Mao thought that a million Chinese smelting in their backyards would equal a Western factory, and Mao told everyone to build blast furnaces, and the farmers melted down their shovels and knives and kitchen pots and pans in backyard f blast furnaces, and the Chinese women were sent out to gather the harvest because there wasn't any work to do in the kitchen without their pots and pans. The men couldn't bring in the harvest because they were too busy with backyard smelting, and that year's harvest was the best in Chinese history. But by the middle of December, China was starving again, and that year the Chinese hunted wild goats to extinction, and sickness followed the starvation. The peasants has, had enthusiastically melted down every piece of iron in sight, including their farming tools, and growing food had not been a prior, priority, but they made a whole lot of pig iron, and from there they were tasked with more metalworking chores. It wasn't production that these furnishes accomplished, Lou went on, it was education. Our people, especially our peasants, have never been around machines as your people have been. They were completely unmechanically minded. Many of them were in awe of technological processes, but now they were encouraged to make their own simple tools, wheelbarrow wheels, gate hinges, even their own ball bearings in a pestle and mortar, and out of iron they themselves had smelted. China, the country Americans are not allowed to know by Felix Green, originally published as Awakened China in the U.S., Awakened China in the U.S., and The Wall Has Two Sides in Britain, New York Balanchine Books, Doubleday and Company, 1961, 1963, page 87. In 1959, and again in 1960, there were huge floods and droughts in China, and people starved all the more. And Mao was mad at Stalin because Stalin had told him to let the Americans help the Koreans. And in 1967, open fighting broke out between Soviet and Chinese troops along the border that was exacerbated by Russia telling China to stay out of the Vietnam War, since Uncle Ho was no longer willing to cooperate with his Russian advisers, but was now running the war all on his own, with weapons and soldiers supplied by China. The North Vietnamese were being sold weapons for no other reason than that the Red Chinese needed the money, and the British had arranged a substantial loan to Uncle Ho. The Chinese Communist leaders became convinced that the Soviets planned to invade their country. Thousands of Chinese were put to work building giant air raid shelters under China's main cities to protect people in case of a Soviet bombing attack. China, the country people, the country Americans are not allowed to know. Page 71. The People's Republic of China had begun on the 1st of October in 1949, after 30 years of civil war, and 40 million Chinese would starve to death by 1960, and Mao's doctor said that Mao was sending Chinese wearing Vietnamese uniforms to fight against the U.S. in Vietnam. The young Mao had left home for the big city when he was 17 years old, and he'd cut off his pigna pigtail, which was punishable by death, and he'd gone with young people hiking all over the country, climbing mountains and being health conscious, like all the other young people were caught up doing all over the world after the Great War. And Mao's friends had believed that China, if given the chance, could rule itself. Mao had gone to Beijing, Peking, and gotten a job at the university working in the library where rich Chinese students would make fun of him. And Mao started his political activism when Sun Yat-sen was overthrown. The Chinese were treated as inferiors by Westerners who would use them as coolie labor, 
and the colonizers, quote, lived in foreign-style mansions surrounded by idyllic parks and race courses. They entertained themselves with their own orchestras, ballet companies, and movie houses, close quote. The White Boned Demon, a biography of Madame Mao Zedong by Russ, Ross Terrell, New York, William Morrill and Company, William Morrow and Company, 1984, page 96. When Mao had gone to school as a young man, the city had been dominated by the British and the French, and the local government was corrupt and was described by Bob Lowe. Officials often cooperated with gangsters with whom kidnapping was a common form of extortion. My mother was too lively for the restrictions of being adequately guarded and was kidnapped twice. Fortunately, the gangsters rarely harmed their captives, nor did they demand exorbitant ransom. The payments were made with police connivance. We children suffered terrible shock when our mother was taken. I hated gangsterism and blamed it on the foreigners. Escape from Red China page 17. During the Japanese occupation of Shanghai, the young communists had worked very hard to bring about the revolution. And the communists hiding in the mountains with Mao's growing army were learning to be soldiers and were making their own uniforms and were all comrades instead of the British division of officers being separate from the enlisted men. And the women were comrades, too, and were allowed to work and fight alongside the Chinese men. Mao's comrades were finally given enough guns from America that they could fight Chiang Kai-shek and his ruthless blue shirts, who had come to chase the communists around before Mao was given some real guns. So America had evened up the fight and knew that Mao would happily do battle with the Japanese while Chiang Kai-shek had not been getting the job done. When Mao started his P People's Republic of China, the British left for Southeast Asia to make trouble for the French. While the Chinese communists were still doing show fu or to convince by talk. After Mao was given enough real ammunition to come out of the hills to drive out the Japanese, Ugly rumors began to appear about Mao, but they were so outrageous that people didn't believe any of the bad stories about their greatly loved leader, and the Chinese believed that lies about Mao were being spread by foreigners trying to win back China for themselves. The last known official visit to Red China had been from the Laotian government, and then the Chinese cut themselves off from the world to concentrate on their communist experiment and MacArthur had been fired for wanting to fight the Chinese, and when MacArthur was removed from command in April of 1951, his pick, Matthew Ridgway, replaced him, and over two and a half million people would die in the Korean War. Ike arranged an armistice on the 27th of July in 1953, and China would pull out of Korea in October of 1958. And by the 60s, the North was doing much better than the South, and the North continued to be ahead of them until the late 80s, when the Japanese and the Americans would help the South to prosper. And they were able to move into Korea because the Soviet un Union was showing signs of stress from all the uprisings fomented from the West, along with the isolation and financial strain imposed upon Russia by the Great Cold War. The Korean Kim's great leader idea was modeled after Mao's success while the Russian reliance on individual Soviets was failing, and Kim Il-sung turned his nat national communism into a cult of personality, but without help from Russia during the Vietnam War and but without help from Russia during the Vietnam War, North Korea quickly slid into poverty. Somewhere along the line, somebody gave nuclear weapons technology to North Korea, hoping they'd use it against Russia, while the North Koreans only wanted to use it against Japan. Meanwhile, the great communist revolution in China was not going well. The hardest working and poorest peasant in the village, a man who labored unceasingly from dawn to dusk, had been designated a landlord's son and was invariably assigned the hardest and heaviest jobs. He worked without a word of complaint.
But the man, in fact, was not a landlord's son. He had been born into one of the village's poorest families, and his impoverished parents, in order to save him, had given him an adoption to a landlord. For that he had been labeled the son of a landlord, forced to work as a coolie, deprived of all rights, and was at the beck and call of the village leaders. Among the impoverished villagers he was the poorest and most miserable, forced to eat the least and the coarsest of rice. His clothes were cast off by others as beyond repair. The father of another so-called landlord's son had never even owned land, but his grandfather had. The label landlord's son was hereditary, passed down from generation to generation. The abuse meted out to the son of the landlord who had owned no land was torture, from which he could not escape. This system of labeling children for the alleged crimes of their fathers, of perpetuating the stigma generation after generation, and treating the offspring like criminals, was obviously unfair. After sixteen years of revolution, it seemed to me that China had not progressed at all. The standard of living was terrible. The government was cruel. Life for the disenfranchised was harsh. However bad life may have been under the Guomintang, hard work and good luck had always brought rewards. Poor people with talent had a chance to rise to the top. The social and economic status of individuals and families was not set in stone generation after generation. Change for the better was always a hope. I did learn something from my participation in the socialist education campaign, but not the lessons Mao wanted me to learn. My alienation grew. My dissatisfaction with the Communist Party deepened. While high-level party cadres ate and drank and lived in luxury, the peasants in the countryside barely subsisted. They were poorer and more miserable than anything I had imagined. What good had the Communist Party done? Where were the great transformations Mao's revolution had wrought? The private life of Cham Chairman Mao, the memoirs of Mao's personal physician by Dr. Li Sui, Sui, Zi Sui, translated by Tai Hung Chao, New York, Random House, Inc., 1994, page 428 and 9. Mao enjoyed having big boxes of cigars sent to him from Fidel, and on the 23rd of January in 1968, the North Koreans seized the USS Pueblo, whose captain was a Boys Town orphan, and the North Koreans understood that JFK had been killed in order to keep America fighting communism. When the captain of the Pueblo refused to apologize to the North Koreans, the U.S. government did it for him, and the captain and all eighty of his crew were shipped home, except for one sailor who'd lost his life in the initial firefight. The Pueblo was 179 feet long and had been rigged for intensive spying, and Mao had asked the Russians to help him, but Russia had been in no position to help short of nuclear war with the West. So Mao had turned China inward, and that's why fighting had broken out between the Soviet and Chinese troops along the border in 1969, but it could have been anonymous commandos from an unknown country trying to make trouble for Russia. In our view, colonial, colonialism is only one aspect of imperialism, and though the United States may not rule as a colonial power, she nevertheless effectively dominates and controls other countries by her financial and commercial power. Americans should understand that we use the word imperialism as a symbol, a kind of shorthand description of the control of one power by another. Let us not split hairs over words. Let us look at the facts. European colonial colonialism, deeply damaging though it was, was at least open. It was admitted, even gloried in. The worst feature of American imperialism is its secrecy secrecy in italics. China, the country Americans are not allowed to know. Page 285. The Western world had conspired to carve up China between them, and the Chinese asked, and what about America? Did she protest? Did she attempt to curb the rapacity of her allies? Did she condemn, did she condemn the wanton sacking of Peking? Wanton sacking of Peking? No protests, no condemnations. China, the country Americans are not allowed to know, page 269. 
The West had wanted to open China for business, but could not help them with their opium problem. And the Chinese thought opium had been thrust upon them as a Trojan horse. And in 1894, the Japanese moved into China, and by 1900, Britain controlled 80% of world trade with China, followed by Germany, France, and then Russia. The Japanese had been invited in by the British to manage factories and to keep the coolie labor in line. And the Chinese boxers rebelled against these foreign devils by trying to throw all the foreigners out in 1900, but the foreign powers banded together to send troops to defeat both the Chinese boxers and the Japanese, since Westerners had a hard time telling them apart. While the boxers were being crushed by foreign troops, the British sent more reinforcements into China, and they took thousands of Chinese students back with them to study in England. The Russian Tsar Nicholas II had built the Trans-Siberian Railroad that ran all the way from Moscow to the port of Vladivostok, and China had tracks running right up to the Trans-Siberian Railway at the border, where the gauge needed to be changed for security reasons. Russian train cars were more narrow than the Chinese, so the entire body of a train car had to be lifted onto a different set of wheels before the train could proceed, and the switchover gave the Chinese time to inspect the freight on board Russian trains. The Chinese were happy that Russia owned Port Arthur because it helped to keep, the Brit keep out the British, as well as the Japanese and Japan captured Port Arthur by force of arms in 1905 in a sneak attack, sinking the Russian fleet without warning, and the British had advised Russia to stay out of Manchuria and China and Tibet. When America put forth a protest over the military action against the boxers, President McKinley was assassinated, and the following year, Britain signed a pact with Japan that if war was declared by anyone on either Britain or Japan, the other would come to do battle for their partner. But if either went to war on their own first, the unattacked partner would not have to participate. The Boer War had just cost the Crown £220 million sterling, and as soon as the 1902 Jap Prit, Jap Brit, Pact was signed, the king and queen of Serbia were assassinated, and the year after that, the Wright brothers flew for the first time in America. Britain celebrated Empire Day on the 24th of May in 1904, as soon as the Japanese had been enticed to go to war with Russia, starting with the surprise attack on the Russian fleet on the 8th of February in 1904, while it was parked at Port Arthur and it would be within two years that the Royal Navy launched their first dreadnought battleship, and Japan was allowed to stay in Korea after the surprise attack on Russia. After the Great War, Germany's possessions in the Shantung province were taken away in 1919 and given to Japan instead of to Britain, and Shantung was all the land between Shanghai and Peking, Beijing. Beijing, Peking. The Chinese in Shantung preferred the Germans to the Japanese, so they asked the Russians to help them after America had refused. And in 1928, Mao was given ammo and war material by the Russians, who were still smarting from the Japanese having sunk their navy in 1904. Mao would go forth in the name of communism to wipe out all the landlords and decadent rich people in Shanghai who had sold China out to the British and their Japanese concubines. FDR called the Arcadia Conference in Washington, D.C. two weeks after Pearl Harbor suffered a sneak attack on the 7th of December in 1941, and it was at Arcadia that FDR proclaimed that America would not allow any of the Allies to settle for a separate peace, and he had called it the Declaration by the United Nations. Arcadia established a Europe-first policy while Churchill wanted a, quote, unified American-British-Dutch-Australian command, close quote, in the Pacific theater that turned out to be a very bad idea, 
and the Americans would begin winning the war against Japan as soon as they stopped using information supplied by the British, claiming to have gotten their information from quote-unquote broken codes they were calling magic purple. The war in the Pacific finally turned in favor of the Americans when a genius young signalman came up with the idea of reporting over his radio that the island of Midway had almost run out of fresh water and the Japanese reported that message on a frequency other than the magic purple channel and the young signalman figured out that the British were not telling the truth about their code breaking. As soon as the Americans stopped using the British magic purple intelligence, they began to win battles, and there would be no more sneak attacks or ambushes coming from the Japanese Navy, except for one, the Indianapolis. Britain had been forced to renounce its alliance with Japan after the Great War, so they had replaced it with naval treaties in 1922, 1930, 1932, and 1936. And when the 1930 treaty was signed, the Japanese, Japanese military had objected to limits imposed on building even more warships, so some Japanese naval officers killed Japan's prime minister in 1930, along with an important executive of Mitsui who was manufacturing golden bat cigarettes spiked with opium to send into, into China for the upcoming invasion. An unfulfilled part of the coup against the civilian government of Japan had included killing Charlie Chaplin, who was visiting Japan at the time, and the conspirators were hoping that America would declare war on Japan because of that murder plot in 1930, but the military had not yet been ready. The young naval officers were arrested, and while they were awaiting a courts martial and certain edu certain execution for the murders? A petition arrived, signed in blood by 350,000 Japanese, along with 11 severed fingers from Japanese patriots, asking to take their place. The Communist May 4th movement in 1923 had completely shut down Shanghai with labor strikes and Chiang Kai-shek had formed an army, with the help of his British advisers, to root out the Russian Jew communists, spurring on the May 4th agitators, and Shek sent troops into Shanghai in April of 1927. After killing all the communists he could find in Shanghai, Shek went after the rest of them in the countryside, and that's when Mao took his communist friends on the long march into the mountains and they walked 6,000 miles in one year, and 80% of them died along the way. The Japanese attacked China in 1931, fanning out over the mainland, and seizing railroads and road crossings and government buildings, and the Russians sent munitions to help Mao. The Japanese dropped bombs on Taiwan, where the British were headquartered, and the Japanese Navy fired on Shandong, Shantung, from warships parked in the Yellow Sea. And while many foreign devils were dying in China, the USS Augusta was parked in the harbor at Shanghai on the Huangpu River in the summer of 1937, when an anti-aircraft shell killed an American seaman from Louisiana, who became the first casualty in World War II. The USS Augusta would become the U.S. flagship for FDR and then for President Truman, and it would be aboard the Augusta that Patton prepared for Operation Torch, and she would carry Bradley to the Normandy beaches on D-Day, and for Dragoon, the Augusta fired over 700 rounds of 203 millimeter shells on German forts that quickly surrendered. In November of 1944, the Augusta was in Philadelphia being refitted when she suffered a mysterious explosion that killed three shipyard workers and four Navy men, and the Augusta would be stripped and modified for participation in Operation Magic Carpet that brought the troops home from Europe at the end of Hitler's war, which had begun in earnest in December of 1937 when Japan invaded and then raped China under color under color of the Marco Polo Bridge incident. 
the Augusta had sailed into Yokohama Harbor on the 4th of June in 1934 to show the flag and had been sailing back and forth between China and Japan until the Marco Polo Bridge incident on the 7th of July in 1937. And FDR ordered the Augusta to sail to Vladivostok on the 24th of July, accompanied by four destroyers, and the captain and the crew were lavishly entertained by the Russians, and it had been the first time a U.S. naval vessel had visited Vladivostok since 1922. Admirable, Admiral Harry Yarnell had skirted a typhoon to reach Vladivostok, and he went right through another on the return trip, with the Augusta managing 30-degree rolls before reaching the Huangpu River on the 14th of August, and they had passed many Japanese ships in Shanghai Harbor, principally light cruisers and destroyers, and the sailor would be killed a week later amidships on the well deck on the 20th of August by a Chinese anti-aircraft shell that wounded 18 others. On the 12th of December, in 1937, Japan sunk the U.S. Pan A <coughs> upriver from Shanghai that had been evacuating Americans, and they also sank three Standard Oil Company tankers. And FDR wanted to blockade oil to Japan, but Britain refused to join the embargo, and FDR had already been embargoing scrap iron to Japan, being used by them to build ships. Admiral Yarnell had gone to great lengths in 1932 to prove to the Navy that the fleet at Pearl Harbor was vulnerable because he'd been in the American delegation at the London Tra Naval Conference of 1930. But the Navy dismissed his warnings and all that was achieved had been the New York Times printing his report in the newspaper. The Japanese claimed that the sinking of the Panay was a mistake, and that the American flags painted on the side of the Panay had not been visible, but the British wanted FDR to know that the attack had been intentional, and they gave him information from the secret Japanese Navy codes intercepted from radio traffic that the British said they were reading from their magic purple devices. After the Panay incident, the code-breaking from the British would never again produce any useful information except for diplomatic traffic, and they never again offered any gleaned military information, and even the diplomatic chatter hadn't been accurate from the very beginning. Japan had most of China under its restraint after 1934 and Chiang Kai-shek made friends temporarily with the communists in order to fight the Japanese, but that changed in 1941 when the British made their support conditional. And these three groups would continue to fight each other in China until Mao emerged the winner after the war. The British had been using their stronghold of Burma to support Chiang Kai-shek, and the Americans had gone along with it until the corruption of Sheck's associates disgusted FDR, as most of them were hoarding weapons and supplies to fight Mao's communists instead of fighting the Japanese. As intelligence reports from the British proved to be not just unreliable but downright dangerous, the American sailor on Midway Island sent out his fake message that the water purification system had broken down and that the island would soon be out of fresh water, and when the Japanese forwarded the message about the Americans' plight at Midway, on Midway, the Americans were able to learn the Japanese code word for Midway Island, and they learned that they were the target of a major attack, and Admiral Nimitz was able to send reinforcements to Midway, including the Yorktown, and the Battle of Midway would be the turning point in the Pacific War. The Yorktown had taken a direct hit by a torpedo bomber in the Battle of the Coral Sea. And the Japanese believed that she'd been sunk, but the Americans had towed the Yorktown to Pearl Harbor, and they thought it would need at least 90 days to repair, but at Pearl Harbor they decided it would take two weeks, and the repairs were done in 48 hours, although some versions said 72 hours, and the final work was accomplished 
while the Yorktown was steaming towards Midway in June of 1942, where it would help sink four Japanese carriers and tilt the balance of power in the Pacific towards the Americans. The Yorktown was named after the final battle of the American War of Independence, where the British had been forced to surrender on the 19th of October in 1781, and malaria had taken out half of the British army and George Washington had been fighting alongside the French. And one-third of the American soldiers had been German-speaking Germans. To get the Yorktown seaworthy again and back to Midway Island, it had taken 1,400 men working around the clock, and they had enacted periodic blackouts of the entire island of Hawaii to make enough power available for the repair work on the Yorktown, and those men would not have been able to achieve that miracle had they not been practicing repairing ships after the attack on Pearl Harbor just six months before. Going on a ship over the massive waters, there has often been the statement that there is nothing to see but water. There is so much to see, a pod of whales following close behind the fantail waiting for the ship to disperse garbage to feed on along with sharks. There is a lot of activity in the waters with turtles and just the amazement of the wave action with the collision of cross waves. The nights on the waters is really great, and the electric eel with its shimmer and the stars at night are of a most magnificent field of guidance. The ocean is magnificent. I enjoyed the dark hours the most in the transporting of the unknown destination for the troops. The dark nights with no moon, the waves and the bow of the ship in rhythm in the breaking of the waters. There was no reflection from the waves with no moon, and the only observation was to look directly over the railings. Looking towards the skies with the many billions of stars, one could only be in awe of where we are in the universe. Looking out over the ocean with many shades of what we call neon, including greens, blues, oranges, pinks, and all streaked together in the speed, in any direction and as far as the naked eye could see, creating sensational experiences of the size of the ocean that one cannot experience on his own in a smaller rig. Seeing the small fish neon by thousands, cutting in and out of the waves as they washed away from the closeness of the ship, the combined effect gave one an awesome feeling of seeing something that no one else ever sees. You are in your own vastness of the universe. The moonlight nights were in an expression of its own in a different visualization sending its lights which exposed the huge swells in the Pacific Ocean which is different from the Atlantic Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is the calm of the sea at the sunset and the shades of darkness there is often parenthesis must be where you can see this at the right time close close parenthesis, which is referred to as the emerald green so beyond one's ability to describe the ocean by the in, by the in, by the equator at the dawn and twilight have magnificent shades of color and artistic features like that of the mountains of Colorado. The light of the moon gives the swells of the Pacific Ocean a crested view of green and folded into the array of dark blues and whites in the swells, which is amazing that it is so quiet. All of this and the rhythm of the ship is an amazing experience. The Life and Stories of Richard Dick Grader by Richard Grader, Victor, Colorado Native, InstantPublisher.com, 2009, page 140 and 41. Churchill had promised at the Arcadia Conference that as soon as Germany was defeated, the British would help the Americans to fight the Japanese. But after seeing the Normandy Theater play itself out, the Americans knew it was better to just drop the bomb. At the Casablanca conference, FDR compromised with Churchill about invading Italy before France, and the deal was that Churchill promised in exchange that the British would supply China through Burma, but those supplies weren't getting through because Chiang Kai-shek was selling the supplies on the black market while his own soldiers starved and froze on the battlefield. And then the Japanese cut the British supply line from Burma. 
The American General Vinegar Joe Stilwell had been a thorn, thorn in the side of the British who were advising Sheck, so Sheck asked FDR to remove Stilwell, and in response, FDR sent Stilwell to meet Mao. By 1941, the Chinese were seriously starving, and Stilwell spoke fluent Mandarin Chinese, and Mao had the support of all the starving people in China. Mao was being given advice from Russia on how to help the poor starving Chinese build communism, and Russia would have been seriously stressed in fighting both Germany and Japan, so the Russians kept a low profile in allowing the Americans to help Mao. Because Mao's communists were considered rebels, the Americans called their meeting with Mao the Dixie Mission, and Japan had not attacked Russia, primarily because they knew Russia was a friend of America. The Japanese rules of war relied on sneak attacks, and if Russia had been attacked before Pearl Harbor, the Americans would have quarantined Japan. In 1931, hundreds of thousands of Chinese had been killed as thousands of Japanese soldiers marched, th marched through China and the Chinese had fought back with a handful of rickety planes given them by the Italians, the Germans, the British, and the Americans, and the dead and the maimed in Nanking were incalculable while the Japanese raped China in December of 1937. When the Japanese sank another American gun gunboat, the U.S. loaned China $25 million to fight the Japanese, and the Russians helped by sending tanks and aid came in from all around the world over the Silk Road from Turkey and through the port of Rangoon over the Burma Road that had been built by the British using coolie labor so they could funnel opium from India into China. After two million Chinese were killed, Japan was still an occupation of half of China, and three million Chinese soldiers would die during Hitler's war along with eight million civilians and 23 million s Russians would be killed, half of them soldiers, and two million Japanese soldiers and three million Japanese civilians would die, and when the war was over there would be no going back to the previous politics that had caused such destruction in the first place, and both Russia and China embraced communism instead of whatever had gone wrong with the world that had brought about Hitler's war, while MacArthur would bring democracy to Japan. At the end of July in 1945, Hashimoto torpedoed the ship that had just delivered the atomic bomb to Hiroshima, and so far, Hashimoto Moto hadn't killed anyone, and the Indianapolis had been his first victory. The captain of the Indianapolis had just given his crew a day off, because he believed there were no Japanese submarines in the area, and so he wasn't zigzagging, and the Japanese said later that the Indianapolis had been a sitting duck. Hashimoto fired a torpedo at midnight on the 30th of July, and it took 12 minutes for the Indianapolis to sink, with 1,200 men on board, and 300 died immediately while the rest went into the sea, and nobody had reported them missing because the mission of the Indianapolis had been done in utmost secrecy. The sun and the sharks were terrible, and drinking seawater was worse, and after three days they were hallucinating and fighting with each other and accusing their friends of being the enemy and pushing them away to drown. The life preservers stopped holding them up, and planes would fly overhead but would fail to see the men in the water, and half of them died before the oil slick from the sunken ship was spotted from a plane, and it took a whole day to get the men out of the sea because they had become spread out for miles, and only one hundred of them were able to be rescued. When Japan surrendered, the captain of the Indianapolis was charged with not taking evasion, evasive action during wartime, but they found him innocent of not abandoning his ship sooner, and the Navy brought Hashimoto over from Japan to testify at his court-martial. The captain was found guilty of hazarding his vessel, but later the Navy put the verdict aside and promoted him, yet he would never again go back to sea. 
People who had lost family members when the Indianapolis went down wrote him nasty letters for years, and on the 6th of November in 1968 he sat on the front porch of his house and shot himself in the head with his navy gun. Hashimoto had just obtained the new improved radar, but so far hadn't shot at anything, and every time he'd found a target, something went wrong or his orders were changed, and the war was almost over, and he knew it. The only question left for Hashimoto was how many Americans he could kill before Japan was invaded, and after delivering the atomic bomb so that it could be loaded onto the Enola Gay, the sailors of the Indianapolis had been carried away by strong ocean currents that made their rescue all the more unlikely after being abandoned to the sea, and when first given fresh water, not a single one of them fought over whose turn it was to receive the next drink of water. Few paid much attention to the Indianapolis tragedy because a second bomb had just been dropped on Nagasaki, and on the bomb had been written a present for the souls of the Indianapolis crew. The guns that the Americans had given Mao to fight the Japanese would be used by Mao against Chiang Kai-shek and his little army of blue shirts, and Mao had the support of the peasants, which was just about everyone in China. America had sympathy for the Chinese, mostly because so many Chinese had come over to build railroads in America, and had blended, for the most part, interacting with Americans, while the Japanese tended to keep to themselves. Britain's pact with Japan in 1902 had required Japan to attack Pearl Harbor, in emphasis. If Britain could prove that America was giving aid to Germany after the British declaration of war against Hitler on the 3rd of September in 1939, the pact the British had made with Japan had evolved into meaning that the Japanese were required by their ongoing alliance with Britain to assist in bringing America to the peace table by any means necessary with the agreement that if either Britain or Japan were attacked by more than one nation, the one not attacked would step in to arrange a peace under threat of having to face the combined might of the two world empires, Britain and Japan. To make matters worse, FDR had been sending aid to China because of the Japanese invasion of 1931, and Japan was claiming that the British were required to step in to stop that American aid to the Chinese and FDR answered that any protest that giving support to China was in violation of American neutrality would be met with his assertion that the war Japan was inflicting upon China was not a legally declared war. The Americans had forced Britain to disavow their alliance with Japan in 1923, but that dissolution had been done under duress, and the Japanese high command knew that the British didn't really mean it, since, after all, they were both empires led by royal families appointed by the deity itself, and that uncontestable reality superseded anything America or anyone else had to say about the matter. America had been helping Germany by doing business with Germans on a rather large scale in 1939, and the understanding that Britain had with Japan in the More Than One Nation Clause had actually first been triggered when Italy joined with France and Ethiopia in 1935, their laughable attempt to counter the British embargo against Italy. And when Russia moved into Poland on the 17th of September in 1939, the More Than One Nation Clause demanded action because America had also been doing business with Russia. It had all seemed so clear and reasonable to the British, and when Stalin made his non-aggression pact with Hitler on the 23rd of August in 1939, the move into Poland two weeks later certainly qualified as an attack by more than one nation. Thus, Japan had no choice but to attack Pearl Harbor unless they wanted to dispense with their long-standing friendship with Britain, something the Japanese considered unthinkable. To uphold their part of the bargain in helping the British bring Germany and Russia to the bargaining table, and because America was friendly to both Germany and Russia, 
the Japanese saw it as their clear duty to commit a police action against America at Pearl Harbor to help their British friends who were now at war with Germany and its quasi-ally Russia. The 1902 Pact had appealed to the Japanese because it stated that if Japan went to war and a third power entered the fight against Japan, then Britain would come to the aid of the Japanese, and it had been intended to prevent any third power from interve intervening in a war Japan wanted to force upon their favorite target, Russia. The fallout was that if Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the British were not required to help Japan fight America, but if America had attacked Japan first, then Britain would have been required to go to war with America and together with Japan's military might, and after France and Poland had been taken out, Britain and Japan could have easily conquered America, as long as Hitler was on board with the plan, and that was to be the penalty imposed upon America if the U.S. refused to support Britain's great game against Russia, or at least have agreed to stay out of the way. The Japanese had sent a delegation to America to negotiate a settlement between Poland, Britain, France, and Germany, Russia, and if America wanted to refuse this overture to an early settlement against Germany and Russia, then the world would learn about the phone call from Churchill warning FDR about the imminent attack on Pearl Harbor that had been tape recorded, for posterity's sake, because the British were doing everything by the book and by treaty and by maritime law. With America's declaration of war against Japan on the 8th of December in 1941, followed by war with Germany and Italy on the 11th of December, the U.S. Coast Guard was given over to the control of the U.S. Navy so they could keep the Royal Navy away from America's shores. Admiral Nimitz would stop the Japanese at Midway after telling some of his diligent American naval officers that he had had a hinky feeling the day of the attack on Pearl Harbor, and so he'd sent four of America's aircraft carriers from Pearl Harbor out to sea that day in pure good luck, just to blow some dust off their decks that morning on the day of infamy, December 7, 1941. Churchill had also been insisting that the Japanese were going to attack Russia, egging FDR on to begin military action against Japan, but FDR had kept his powder dry and even refused Admiral Yarnell's demand that more warships be sent to China in the summer of 1937, specifically Yarnell's request for a division of heavy cruisers, but FDR had refused him the escalation. Churchill had warned FDR for many months that Japan was going to attack Russia, and he was fervent and incisive about that. But FDR always brushed him off with the same detached politeness given to anyone who drank as much as Churchill. The Korean peasants had rioted against the Japanese in Korea in 1882 and had chased them into the sea, where they had been rescued by the British ship HMS Flying Fish. The Qings in China sent 4,500 troops to help the Koreans, so the Japanese sent four warships and a battalion of troops, and a treaty was signed before things got out, of the, got out of hand that allowed the Japanese to keep some bases in Manchuria, and Chinese advisors were allowed to stay in Korea. The Japanese tried to take over Korea again two years later, in 1884, but were beaten back by the Chinese. And the following year, Japan sent seven warships and two battalions of soldiers, and another treaty was signed, but this time both sides were required to remove their troops from Korea. The Manchu in China had come from what was originally the Jin dynasty, who had come from Manchuria, and Mao would put an end to the ineffective Manchu who were unable to control the flood of opium coming into China and the Jin dynasty had lasted for 100 years until the Mongols conquered them. The Manchu came back in 1644, after the Mings had managed to kick out the Mongols, and the Manchu were now called Qings, and they would complete the Great Wall of China that the Mings had fortified to keep out the Mongols, and the Qings would finish the Great Wall, Great wall to keep out both the Mongols and the Mings. 
Japan relied on soybeans being grown by Korean peasants who regularly revolted against the Korean king for lower taxes and more land of their own. And in 1889, a poor soybean harvest caused the Korean king to stop exports to Japan to keep Korea itself from starving. And when the peasants rose up again four years later in 1893, the Japanese landed 6,000 troops in Incheon. <coughs> The Qing sent 1,500 soldiers and made an agreement with the peasants that lowered their taxes and awarded them more land if only they agreed to go back to the soybean fields so the Korean king could continue to collect taxes on soybeans being sold to Japan. Many Korean landowners did not cooperate with the agreement and the peasants revolted again. And the Korean king asked the Chinese Qings in 1894 to send 2,800 soldiers to put down the peasant uprising. And the Japanese landed 8,000 troops and captured the Korean king. <coughs> the Japanese military was being trained by the British. And Japan had ordered two battleships being built for them in England and the Korean peasants were fighting with bows and arrows and with spears and swords and an occasional antique musket. The Japanese brought with them their first Maxim machine gun knockoffs, and the Maxim machine gun could shoot as much as 40 men with rifles and had a range of two and a half miles. The Quings had been unable had been able to negotiate with the Japanese over Korea for so many years that they did not respond strongly enough this time, and they had never seen a machine gun, and Korea became littered with mutilated corpses because the Japanese had some weird thing about dismembering the dead. The Quings thought the Japanese would return back to Japan again after the North after the Korean peasants left alive had gone back home to grow more soybeans, but this time the Japanese stayed, and more troops came from Japan and steamrolled over the Chinese Qings, who lost Taiwan to the Japanese and were so weakened by the Sino-Japanese War that the rest of the world were able to take over China and partition it among themselves. By 1900, the Chinese peasants had enough of the foreigners and rose up in the Boxer Rebellion and troops arrived from all over the different western countries to quell the boxers, who were so named because they were kung fu fighters, and that was close enough to the western form of boxing to be given that name. Japan sent 20,000 troops to China to quash the boxers, while the boxers were also fighting the Chinese government who were trying to negotiate with the Western powers in hopes they would help keep Japan off the mainland. China offered to pay all the foreigners to put down the boxers if only they agreed that Japan was not allowed in China, and China offered to make payments on the deal until 1940. And after the Boxen Boxer Rebellion was crushed, Britain made their alliance with Japan in 1902, and the Japanese went home to build up their military for the next round. After the Chinese lost the Sino-Japanese War in 1895, the Koreans had turned to Russia for help getting rid of the Japanese, and the Korean king had asked the Russians to build a railroad, and it was under construction when the boxers rose up. And Russia sent a couple hundred thousand soldiers into Manchuria to protect their railroads that were being built as a joint Chinese-Russian venture. And in February of 1904, the Japanese attacked the Russian fleet at Port Arthur using torpedo boats after giving the Tsar a three-hour warning, and two months later the British press showed up in force. The British had been sharing telegraph and radio messages with Japan that the British were intercepting from the Russians, and the Japanese knew they had to attack the Russian fleet before Russia completed its Trans-Siberian Railway that would be able to quickly bring troops to help the Koreans. And when the Russian fleet of the Pacific was, was destroyed, the Tsar dispatched the Baltic fleet to Manchuria, but the British denied them the use of the Suez Canal, and the Russians had to sail around the Cape of Good Hope at the bottom of Africa. 
When the Russian Baltic fleet finally arrived in Korea, the Japanese were waiting for them, and out of 38 Russian ships, only three made it into port, and the Russians had burned a half million tons of coal getting there.